Hello beautiful people of the internet, my name is Jackie and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today in this video I will be doing my wrap up for the months of November and December 2019. 2020 is finally here so in this video I am going to wrap up the books that I read at the end of the year and then next week I'm going to have a Christmas book haul for you and then I will be doing my general wrap up of 2019 talking about the statistics, how many books I read, when favorites were and then I will also be talking about my 2020 reading goals. Then three videos from now I am finally going to post the vlog that I filmed in England in which I read every single Jane Austen novel. I wanted to wait until after this wrap-up to post that because I'm going to be talking about two of those books in this video and then by that point it's already January so I need to do my end of 2019 video so <laughs> you guys have waited a while for it but three weeks. It's finally coming out. Now let's get into this video. In November and December I read five books for a total of 2,365 pages and my average star rating was 4.2. I liked most of these books a lot. There were there was a miss which I'm going to be talking about but overall really good way to end the year. Very happy with it. The first book I'm going to talk about, I don't have a physical copy right now because I returned the one that I used in school and my copy that I own is back in Florida, which I'm going back to Florida today. So don't have it right now. However, this book was Emma by Jane Austen and I ended up really, really liking this one and I gave it five stars. I know that Emma is not a lot of people's favorite Austen. It really has mixed opinions. There are some people who absolutely love it and some people who it really doesn't do much for them. And personally, I loved it. Emma follows our title character Emma Woodhouse who is a young wealthy woman living in a small town with her agoraphobic father. Emma is a very wealthy young woman with a very high opinion of herself and though she personally doesn't feel the pressure to marry she likes to play matchmaker for other people in her town and this ends up getting her into trouble especially with her brother-in-law Mr. Knightley. When Emma befriends a young woman named Harriet she decides that she's going to find Harriet a husband among the men in her village. However, it goes very wrong. Emma also gets involved in some romantic misadventure of her own with a man who comes to town. I really did like this book. I think the reason why some people may not like it as much is because it's very character driven. It's not one that's going to be as plot heavy as some of Jane Austen's other books but something about this story I just really loved and the characters and the atmosphere of it. Even though there weren't as many dramatic events as some other Austens, I really enjoyed it and I really don't have many complaints about the book. Emma is a character that a lot of people don't like. I know in my class there were some people who found her very very irritating. However, I found her kind of endearing. She is very flawed but obviously she undergoes a character journey in the story and personally I really like Mr. Knightley and I'm interested to see if any of you out there who have read it what you think because Pretty much everybody in my class hated him and they hated the romance in this book. However, personally, I liked both. So that seems to be an unpopular opinion, but I want to know if any of you guys out there agree with me. Overall, I thought Emma was so much fun and just enjoyable from start to finish, so I think it is now among one of my favorite Austins and I would really like to know what you guys think. Up next is my lowest rated book of these two months and that was The Perfect Mother by Amy Malloy. I wasn't sure if I wanted to give this book two stars or three so I ended up giving it two and a half. It's not that I think this was a bad book. I think it just had a lot of wasted potential and I think it could have been better if some things had been done differently. The Perfect Mother is a domestic thriller. The main characters are a group of women known as the May Mothers. They are a mother's group who all gave birth in the same month so they have babies around the same age and they're navigating first-time motherhood together. However, 
women all go out together one night and one of the women's baby is kidnapped from his crib while she is out and she becomes a suspect in her own son's disappearance but the whole story covers what really happened to this baby and I will say the author did something very very clever in this book which really threw me off her trail. The ending was something that I didn't predict until maybe like 10 pages before it happened, maybe even less. So she definitely did something very, very clever that I did not see coming. However, overall, I just feel like this book could have been a lot better had certain things been done differently. It was definitely not a bad book, but I think there were so many characters and it really wasn't necessary. I think that there were a lot of things that were set up in this book and then never fully realized that didn't need to be there. So I definitely think that the author could have edited certain things out. I don't think we needed as many characters as we had. And I didn't feel like I fully got to know them because of that. I wasn't really attached to anyone. It definitely was not a bad book. However, I just think it needed some work and some improvements. I'm not sure if this was the author's first novel. It definitely read like it was, but I'm not 100% sure. So maybe she's written other books before. So I definitely think this was a good first effort. However, if she were to read more books, I think she just needs time to improve. And I hope this doesn't make me sound like a bitch. I don't think it was bad. I just think, you know, it could have done things differently and the story would have improved had there been some more edits, certain things that were cut out. I would definitely read more by this author if she came out with more books because I definitely think she has a lot of potential. I definitely think she could be sort of like a Leanne Moriarty type of author because this was very reminiscent of Leanne Moriarty's books, very reminiscent of something like Big Little Lies. I, yeah, I just think that with more time, this author could improve. And <laughs> I feel bad for saying this, like I don't think she's good enough. I'm just saying it read very much like a debut novel and I think subsequent novels by this author would be better. I hope that doesn't come across as rude. <laughs> the next book that I read, I actually listened to on audiobook through the Libby app. I should mention I also read The Perfect Mother on Libby, but I read that as an ebook. Libby is a really great app. Um, if you don't have it already, you just download it and you sign in with your library card and then you can get ebooks and audiobooks from your library. It's great. So I listened to this on audiobook. <laughs> that was a very long way just to say that, which I usually don't like audiobooks that much. This is only the second that I've ever listened to. However, I had a specific reason why I picked an audiobook for this. This book was Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman, which I ended up giving five stars. This book is, I'm not really sure what word to call it. It recounts the stories from Norse mythology as told by Neil Gaiman. They are all told in his style and he adds dialogue and action and descriptions to make it read more like a book. So it's not like he's just saying Thor did this and Loki did that. He says things like, you know, Thor says this and Loki does that, uh, Freya does this, to make it read more like a novel. So it's basically the Norse myths retold in Neil Gaiman's style. I wanted to listen to this on audiobook because I wanted to be able to hear all the pronunciations of the different Norse names and words and I definitely think that was really helpful. Also the audiobook is narrated by Neil Gaiman himself and I always think that's really cool when an author narrates their own audiobook and he was definitely really great to listen to. I think he did a great job both as an author and as an audiobook book narrator. I ended up giving this five stars because even though I usually reserve five stars for books that are going to be my new favorites, there was really nothing about this book that I felt like needed work or needed to be changed. I'm not an expert on Norse mythology by any means. This was really 
my introduction to it. I wanted to learn more about it because I took a class on Vikings this semester, so Norse mythology was something that was touched on very briefly and I wanted more information. I just found this so informative but also so engaging. It really was intensely readable and something that was great to listen to. I think there are lots of really great little stories in here. I think my personal favorite was called Freya's Wedding and it involves Thor and Loki dressing up as women <laughs> to trick a giant. It was great. So overall, nothing but positive things to say about this. If you find Norse mythology interesting or if it's something that you might want to learn more about, I think this is a great place to start. I would never actually read a Neil Gaiman before, but I would definitely like to check him out more in the future because I enjoyed this audiobook so much. Also, if you guys watched my study abroad vlog, specifically the one where we went to Blenheim Palace the day the golden toilet arts installation was stolen, I will link that video down below if you haven't seen it. Apparently, Neil Gaiman was also at Blenheim Palace the same day that I was. Another kid in our program was going around telling everybody that he saw Neil Gaiman. And based on where he saw him at the palace and at what time, my roommate and I probably walked right past Neil Gaiman and didn't even realize because we were coming from the place he was going to at that time. So... I probably walked right past Neil Gaiman and was so absorbed in talking, I didn't even realize it. But I also hadn't read any of his books at that point either, so what would I have said to him? Like, hey, you're a really famous author and I haven't read your stuff, but I heard you're good. It would have been so awkward. <laughs> okay, I finally have a physical book to hold up. The next book that I read and the first book I read in December was Persuasion by Jane Austen. This was the final Jane Austen I had to read for my Jane Austen class in Bath. And I ended up giving Persuasion four and a half stars out of five. Persuasion is the last complete novel that Austen wrote before her death, and it follows 27-year-old Anne Elliot. Anne is, by Regency-era standards, rapidly becoming an old maid because she is 27 years old and not married. Years ago, Anne accepted a marriage proposal from Captain Frederick Wentworth. However, her family convinced her to break it off because they didn't think that Wentworth was going to be able to make enough money to support her and they thought that Anne could make a better match. So even though Anne loved Wentworth, she broke it off with him. Now, years later, the two of them see each other again and Anne quickly realizes that she is still in love with Wentworth, but she doesn't know if she can ever win him back. Persuasion is a lot of people's absolute favorite Austin. I had really high expectations, and while I did enjoy this a lot, I wouldn't say it is my all-time favorite. What I really liked about this was Anne as a main character and also the Anne Wentworth relationship. Because this is one of the last books that Austin wrote, I think there is a real maturity to it that I really enjoyed. And I think that Anne and Wentworth have a relationship that I genuinely believe could work out. I can understand why they work as a couple and why they love each other, which I can't say for all Austin relationships because there were some that I really wasn't a fan of. But with these two, I bought the love story and I actively rooted for it. Again, with this being a later work by Austin having a more mature tone, it was also much more serious and not as optimistic, which I understood. However, I don't know if personally when I read an Austin, that's what I want. I definitely want something that's going to have more of a happy ending because for me, Austin is a form of escapism, I guess. So I think I like something that does have a very happy ending, even if that's maybe not as realistic. And the somber moments in here, wow, I just said somber, really weird. The somber moments in here are definitely more realistic. It's not necessarily what I want from my Austin. I hope that makes sense. I don't know if I explained that well at all. <laughs> However, I will add another thing that I really liked about this is that even though it is pretty short as far as Austin novels go, I didn't feel like it was lacking in any way. I didn't think, oh, well, I wish she had developed this for another 100 pages. I would have loved to read another 100 pages of Persuasion had Austin written them, but I didn't think it needed another 100 pages. Even though it was short, I felt like it was fully developed 
developed. I can't say the same for something like Northanger Abbey, which is another really short Austen. That one, which she wrote at the beginning of her career, I definitely think could have used more development. I think you definitely see how Austen honed her craft over time with this one, and I think it was a really well done, fully realized story. And now, lastly, for the final book that I read in December, and the final book I read in 2019, the final book I read this decade, actually, was The Sun and Splendor by Sharon K. Penman, which I ended up giving four stars. The Sun and Splendor is a book that I bought on Book Outlet a couple years ago and I've really wanted to get to. I was very intimidated by its large size. Sorry, my bookmark is still in here. But I'm so glad I finally got to it. This the Sun and Splendor is a historical fiction that I've really wanted to get to for a couple of years now. It is a novelization of the life of Richard III. Now, Richard III is a king of England who has a very bad reputation, partially because of how he was vilified after his defeat and death. And also Shakespeare's Richard III, which depicts him as a hunchback, manipulative villain, which really isn't historically accurate, but again, was born out of Tudor era propaganda. I've always been interested in Richard III ever since I watched the White Queen miniseries. After that, I really started to do a lot of research about him and I reconsidered what I thought I knew about him. I especially love his relationship with his wife, Anne Neville, which is depicted beautifully in this book. And I really enjoyed their scenes together and the way that Sharon K. Penman was able to depict their relationship. The reason that I didn't give this five stars is because I thought part one of the book really dragged. Part one focuses mostly on the rise of Richard's elder brother, Edward, who became King Edward IV during the War of the Roses. And I think part one focused so much on the war and on Edward, which is something that I have seen in fiction before. It wasn't really what I wanted out of this book. So for those couple hundred pages, I really wasn't that interested because I felt like I wasn't getting enough of Richard. There were some choices that I would have made differently had I written this book. For one, I would have preferred if the book had been written, if not entirely, then a little bit more from Richard and Anne's perspectives. There were a lot of other characters who would narrate chapters that I really just didn't care about or didn't care about as much. So I would have written this book entirely from Richard and possibly also Anne's perspectives or at least cut out some of the other perspectives that were in here because I just wasn't as engaged by them. And especially in part one, there would be chapters and chapters where Richard barely played a part at all and that wasn't really what I wanted from this book. However, once I got to part two, I was definitely engrossed. That was the point where we started to focus more so on Richard's relationship with Anne, which I found so compelling. And I think the way that Sharon K. Penman balances meticulous research with also amazing fictionalization of events and relationships was amazing. I thought she did a great job on both those fronts. So while The Sun and Splendor really had a slow beginning and I was expecting to be disappointed after reading part one, once I got through those couple hundred pages, I was all in and I was totally absorbed by the way that Sharon K. Penman told the story. I liked her depiction of Richard. I think she gave a much more sympathetic and fair depiction of him. And I love the relationship with Anne. I thought some of their moments together were so beautiful. It just, it just made my soul so happy. I love my doomed historical ship. I love them. All right, everyone, those were the books that I read in November and December 2019. Let me know, have you read any of the books that I did these past two months? And if so, what did you think of them? Do you agree with me, disagree? Let me know in the comments. Please like this video if you enjoyed and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more from me. I post new videos every single Wednesday. My social media links are down below if you want to follow me on Tumblr, Instagram, or be my friend friend on Goodreads. Thank you so much for watching this video and I hope you have a merry rest of your day. Bye and I'll see you in the next one.